the other way around. Isn't that right, Mr. Holman Vader? Come find me, Harry, I'm scared! The studio rejected my idea of a sequel. For some reason, the studio just won't go for it. Crazies. What if a grown-up Kevin McAllister appeared in a Home Alone sequel? This is Fanscription. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, folks. With the most wonderful time of the year upon us, I think we're just about ripe for a Home Alone what if, wouldn't you say? There have been rumors, parodies with the original actors, and four sequels since Macaulay Culkin and company left the franchise, but a true continuation of the first two films has never officially come to pass, and likely never will. No, no, Home Alone 4 doesn't count. One of the most interesting pitches I've heard for a sequel came in the form of a joke from director Chris Columbus. In the 2007 commentary track for the DVD release, Columbus said this. The studio rejected my idea of a sequel, which was years, you know, now, you actually, you being in jail, coming back to take revenge on Joe and Danny, who live in the suburbs next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got their families. They've gone straight. They've gone straight. And you've got your... <laughs> That's great. I, I, I see something there, but they, uh, for some reason, the studio just won't go for it. Crazies. In the years since, plenty of other angles on continuing Kevin's story have been shared across the internet, but this one here is the most intriguing to me. I won't use everything Columbus said there, but honestly, the general premise is solid. The question is, can we make this idea work? A few of the main reasons I believe that first pair of films functioned so well was because of the combination of hilarious slapstick and genuine heart centered around the Christmas season. The look of the films with their bright colors and atmosphere also kind of have a sad darkness to them. They contain this almost tangible sense of melancholy that surrounds some of the story and characters. John Hughes, Chris Columbus, and the rest of the crew weren't afraid to let dramatic scenes breathe. Throw in John Williams's iconic musical score and audiences across the world cared about Kevin in a way that transcended a silly kids film. I say all this because those more pensive elements have to be incorporated into a story featuring an adult Kevin McAllister. It can still be a family film, but mixing in drama with the comedy is a must to make this work. Considering stuff like this is what Fanscription was made for, we're going to give it our best shot. So get your chestnuts, hot chocolate, and paint cans ready. What if an adult Kevin McAllister was the main character in a new Home Alone movie? Our movie is titled Home Alone Again. I know the Google Assistant ad used this name, but it would be perfect for a film since the other sequels took up the numbers. The story picks up 25 years after the second flick. Kevin is now in his 30s with a 10-year-old son of his own. He still lives near Chicago and resides in a modest home with a decent job at a home security company. One of the details I actually thought was sort of interesting about 2021's Home Sweet Home Alone. He's vastly underpaid, but enjoys the work. Kevin's son, named Peter, is like his father in some ways. He's obviously very resourceful and intelligent, which eases Kevin's mind when he has to leave him at home when working late. But overall, the kid is less of a smart aleck and more cheerful, especially around Christmas. His positive disposition effectively hides a somewhat gloomy demeanor that occasionally sneaks out. Last Christmas, Kevin's wife walked out on them and hasn't been seen since. She took much of the family's savings, leaving Kevin and Peter in poor financial shape. The past couple months, the boy has been sending letter after letter to Santa, requesting that his mother return for Christmas this year. Despite Kevin trying to temper his expectations, Peter is hopeful that St. Nick will provide a holiday reunion. On an afternoon a few weeks before Christmas, we see Kevin called into his boss's office, where he's delicately let go. The security company is downsizing, and they have to cut every department in half, including Kevin's engineering division. Sulking at home that night, Kevin's mother calls him. They don't talk as regularly as either would like, and with most of the other kids living out of state, it's a regret Kevin holds on to. The guilt he feels is also fueled by his father, Peter McAllister, 
unexpectedly passing away a few years ago. This event took place around Christmas as well. Stubborn as ever, Kevin doesn't tell his mom about his firing and has always refused any monetary aid. Kate says she's just checking in on her youngest son and often worries about him after last year's mess. She reminds him about Christmas dinner. They finally have all the siblings and cousins coming in for a get-together. This hasn't happened in at least a decade. She's expecting Kevin and Peter to be there and asks if he wants to put in for Secret Santa. Kevin pulls up his paltry bank account and hesitantly says, sure. An incoming call on the other line pops up on his phone. The caller ID reads it's the local police department. Annoyed as if he knows what's coming, he rushes his mom off the phone and answers. Simply saying that he'll be there soon, he looks back with a disappointed frown at Peter, who's engrossed in a video game. He mentions he'll be back in a few minutes. When Kevin leaves, we see Peter take out another Santa letter he's been hiding from his dad. He also pulls out a picture depicting Kevin, Peter, and his mom from happier times. They're posed in front of a gigantic Christmas tree. Cut to the local jail, where Buzz, now an unemployed drunken loser, sees that Kevin has bailed him out. Again. In a somewhat humorous exchange, they walk together on the street outside. The older brother thanks the younger for keeping these run-ins with the law between them. He doesn't know how their mom would react at this point. Buzz asks Kevin if he's going to Christmas dinner and says he misses little Peter, who Buzz considers much smarter and tolerable than Kevin was at that age. He questions if Kevin remembers how much of a trout sniffer the youngest McAllister was. Kevin gets upset for a moment and tells Buzz that if he calls him that again, he'll leave him in jail next time. Buzz laughs, but backs off. Kevin ignores him the rest of the way and sees off his still somewhat inebriated brother when they get close to his apartment building. Kevin paces through his neighborhood on his way home. The atmosphere here really needs to shine through with the cinematography and music. It's all lit up for the holiday, but he's had such a difficult time connecting with the season he loved as a kid. It seems that every year now, all Christmas time means is losing something else. Outside the window of his house, he watches Peter place a few ornaments on the tree. He exhales into the cold air and takes another look at his bank account which is now near zero. The next shot sees a door open with Kevin dressed in a little Nero's delivery guy outfit. He hands off a box of pizzas and takes a few dollars in cash from the customer. This starts a montage with ironically cheery Christmas music playing. Kevin drives around in his car with pizzas on the passenger seat, occasionally stealing a slice. We see him yelled at by his new boss, getting doors slammed in his face, dropping boxes, fumbling money, and generally hating his new job. The montage ends with Kevin pulling up to a huge house. This place makes his moms look cheap. A bit in awe, he knocks on the door with a huge stack of pizza boxes, only leaving his eyes unobstructed. The door flies open, and we see Kevin's expression widen with shock. Cutting to the open door, we see the man standing there is none other than Kevin's childhood enemy, Harry. He's dressed in fine clothes and looks visibly older, but Kevin would recognize that face anywhere. There seems to be a big holiday party happening inside. Kids are running around, adults are enjoying themselves in conversation while sipping on festive beverages, and Christmas music completes the scene. Harry pats his pockets and calls for his stepson to come get the pizzas and pay the delivery man. He politely tells Kevin to wait a moment as he walks back into the serenity of his home. A teenage boy arrives to take the pizzas, but Kevin's gaze has not left Harry, who's smiling and chatting it up with his guests in the background. Non-responsive, he's given money and told to keep the change as the door slowly closes in his face. It takes Kevin a few moments to gather himself. He peers in through one of the windows and still can't believe his eyes. The door unexpectedly opens again, and a familiar voice yells for the pizza guy. Kevin pretends he dropped something to distract suspicion until he sees the other half of the wet slash sticky bandits, Marv, looking right at him. He apologizes for the teenager shortchanging him and hands Kevin an extra few bucks. Still unable to speak, McAllister just stares in disbelief. After a moment, Marv says the delivery guy looks awfully familiar. As dim-witted as the last time we saw him, Marv smiles and compares Kevin to Brad Pitt before returning inside the house. After a beat, he steps out again to quickly return Kevin's wallet, apologizing and saying, old habits die hard, 
before re-entering the house. We cut to the same police station from earlier. Kevin is now talking to a third disinterested cop who listens to his story again. McAllister exhaustively speeds through the events of the first two films. Before he can finish, he's called into a detective's office where the competent official mentions that he's been going through Kevin's file and sees that Harry and Marv were arrested across the street from his parents' house in 1990. He decides to give McAllister a break and fills him in on the situation. Harold Lyme and Marvin Merchants were released from prison on good behavior a decade ago. Harry married into a very rich family, Marv moved into his guest house, and they've been living in Chicago for years. Neither of them have caused any trouble since their release. Kevin is incredulous and demands they be arrested immediately before more people are put in danger. The detective is patient at first, but reaches his limit when Kevin doesn't stop his indignant yelling. This results in Kevin running his hands through his hair before they land on his face as he screams in frustration. Hey there, Fanscription faithful, Walter here. I just wanted to let you know that my personal YouTube channel has relaunched as Walter Culture. Since the end of September, I've been putting up weekly videos featuring brand new reviews, unboxings, versus episodes, and more, along with monthly live streams featuring unseen content from the Walt Vault. So come join me, and I'll also go in depth on Pat's fanscription episodes, including this one here. That's youtube.com slash at Walter Culture. Also, follow me on social media at Walter Culture on X and at Walter Culture 88 on Instagram and Facebook for more previews on future projects. Now, back to fan scripture. We cut to Kevin blankly staring forward on a park bench. He forces himself up, and we see that he's outside a similar church to the first movie. He walks inside the mostly empty sanctuary to see the choir practicing haunting Christmas hymns. Kevin sits in a pew and tries to calm down, absorbing the ambience. Eventually, he starts speaking, seeming to ask God why this has all happened to him. His father, his wife, his job, his strained relationship with his son, and now the crooks that almost killed him are once again on the loose. He starts to get angry and eventually stands up, defiantly proclaiming, No! This is my life! I have to defend it! His words echo through the church, as the choir and a few people sitting around all stare at him. Self-aware, he slowly exits the pew. Before walking further down the aisle, he turns around and attempts to genuflect before leaving in awkward silence. We smash cut to Kevin making a few purchases at a local convenience store. Duct tape, rope, tinsel, and a cart full of various seemingly unrelated items. He hammers away in his basement, making loud noises that get his son's attention. Kevin is constructing something and warns the kid not to go into that basement no matter what. A bit intimidated, Peter agrees. He feels like his dad has been ignoring him and often retreats to his picture of happier times. Finally, on Christmas Eve night, we see Kevin and Peter eating a silent meal at a gimmicky two-thirds empty restaurant. The next scene sees them walk into their house and Peter is being more bratty than usual, exclaiming how disappointed he is. The food wasn't anything like his mother's Christmas cooking. Already on edge, this sets Kevin off. He unloads about how she left them, how she took their savings, how he's had to deliver pizzas for weeks just so they had enough money for that meal, and how Peter's attitude is ruining any good feelings the season has left for Kevin. He sends Peter to his room and tells him he's going to sleep early tonight. The kid tries to argue, but is shut down fast. Angry, he stomps to his room and slams the door. Kevin immediately feels horrible and goes to knock on Peter's door, but stops himself when his watch beeps. He hesitantly pulls himself away, and we quick cut to his home security system being enabled, Kevin packing up his supplies, and looking over the house one more time before turning the lights off and leaving. Cut to Marv smoking a cigarette outside the guest house in Harry's backyard. It's after midnight. Everyone is asleep. He thinks he hears something in the bushes, but pays it no mind. Marv flicks the cigarette into the snow and enters the guest house. He turns out the lights and readies himself for bed, climbing onto his mattress and covering himself with a blanket. He hears another noise and turns over. For a moment, 
he sees someone in a Santa Claus mask laying next to him. He begins to scream in his signature high pitch before he's knocked out. This wakes up Harry, who walks to his window and watches a car speed off in the street. Suspicious, he checks everything out and eventually sees that Marv is missing. Marv has a black hood ripped off his head. When he comes to, a single bright light shines down as he notices he's tied to a chair with a big knot protruding from his forehead. The man in the Santa Claus mask steps into the light and the scene proceeds with the figure warning Marv not to try and escape. There's no way out. Marv tries anyway and sees that there's nowhere to go. He tries to talk tough, but Santa isn't playing around. The figure says that the former burglar has a lot to answer for, and his friend will join him soon enough. With that, he leaves Marv, who begins screaming for help. <coughs> Cut to the upstairs, where the basement door is shut. Kevin takes off the Santa mask. He's completely soundproofed the lower level, so Marv's pleas aren't heard. Kevin repacks a few things for another go at Harry's, but stops himself and walks over to Peter's room. He enters to see his bed empty and no sign of him anywhere in the house. Kevin finds the Santa letter his son was writing, never delivered, with the old family photo next to it, and immediately becomes worried. Before he can act, police lights flash across his face as sirens blare. Kevin bolts, escaping the cops before they even see him. He watches a few officers try to break in before being called away to chase down a sighting of Kevin. Marv can hear some of the goings-on upstairs, and comically, he's left in the basement alone, wailing for help. From here, the story shifts to a chase. Kevin is on the run from the cops throughout Chicago, while also desperately searching for his son. Peter is shown traveling by himself in the middle of Christmas Eve night, but we don't know where he's going. A few heartwarming scenes depict Peter's kindness to strangers as he makes his way across the city. We'll even throw a few frightening ones in there, a la the first sequel. We see more of Kevin's search in a parallel to his mother's pursuit in the original films. He has to keep a low profile and can't enlist the cops for aid. Throughout the night and the following Christmas day, Kevin will run into people and situations that remind him of the spirit of the season along with a few slapstick moments that flip the script on him while running from the cops and chasing down his kid. We'll cut back to Marv quite a bit, as this is where that signature physical humor will come from. Kevin booby-trapped his basement, and just when Marv thinks he's escaped, he runs into another obstacle. This would even apply to some of the first level too when Marv finally gets up there. All the exits are secured by Kevin's system and code. From the inside, there really is no way out. We can add some of the classic gags here, like angels with filthy souls, and throw in a few new ones. Maybe a recording of Kevin will play revealing his identity to Marv in a taunting fashion. In reverse of the original two films, one of the wet bandits will be trying to escape Kevin's house instead of breaking into it. Daniel Stern would have been in his late 50s at this point, and I think he could still handle some of the bits. We'd keep Joe Pesci's Harry out of this situation since he was in his early 70s back then and save him for special scenes. As Christmas Day turns to night, Kevin has a moment to read his son's letter to Santa and stares at the family picture. It's then he has an epiphany and knows where to go. In a pinch, he calls Buzz to pick him up, no questions asked, and he arrives just in time. Kevin's on the run from a few pursuing cops when he hops in the car and the brothers hightail it out of there. As with Buzz's trouble with the law, they agree to keep this from their mother. Buzz drops his little brother off at Millennium Park on Christmas night and speeds off to avoid more issues with the boys in blue. Kevin is bruised and battered from the ordeal, but he limps up to Chicago's official tree to see his son waiting there alone. Mutually relieved, they embrace as father apologizes to son. He knows the kid was waiting for his mom there. Peter thought if there was one place she'd show up on Christmas night, this would be it, where they all were most happy. Emotionally, Kevin admits he doesn't know why his mom left or where she is now, but he guarantees that he'll always be there for his son. He's sorry for ignoring him and knows nothing is more important than being together, especially on Christmas. To prove it, he brings out a pair of small porcelain turtle doves and vows that as long as they each have one, they'll be friends forever.
Interrupting the reunion are a few cop cars. They pull up to the park and exit, walking straight for Kevin. The last person to exit one of the vehicles isn't an officer, though. It's Harry himself. The cops begin to arrest Kevin when Lime steps in. Now that he's found the perpetrator and his suspicions were confirmed, he decides not to press charges. He knew Kevin might one day come after him and Marv, but surprisingly, they actually have turned over a new leaf. Harry's wife changed his life for the better. The money was admittedly a huge bonus, but he has become a different person and apologizes to McAllister for everything they put him through. He looks down to Peter and smiles with a diamond-encrusted tooth where the gold one used to be. Harry looks back to Kevin, saying he knows better than anybody when someone deserves a break. Genuinely, he wishes the McAllisters a Merry Christmas and tells Kevin to spend what's left of it with his son. He sticks out his hand, which still has a scarred M on the palm, and they shake on it. Harry says he has just one question. Where's Marv? Kevin sheepishly grins. We dissolve to Marv exiting Kevin's house with a few officers holding up his damaged body. He sees Harry and hugs him, which Lime reciprocates by patting him on the back and telling him to let go. We again dissolve away, this time to the famous Home Alone house, where the family party is still going. Kevin and Peter enter to everyone's delight. They all surround them, welcoming and excited, including a special acknowledgement from Buzz. Uncle Frank sees who it is and rolls his eyes, walking off. The crowd parts with Kate on the other end of the room. Slowly and with big smiles, Kevin and his mom embrace. He says he told her they'd make it. Peter joins in for a group hug before running off to play with his cousins. The touching moment stops when Buzz bumps into Kevin and pretends to cough while saying, Trout Sniffer. We cut to the exterior of the house as snow falls, with Kevin yelling Buzz's name into the echoing Christmas night. The credits begin to roll. And that's our version of what we'd call Home Alone Again. Did you like it? Hate it? Have a better idea for how this story could play out? Let me know in the comments, and we'll see you the next time we unwrap a fresh fanscription present. Have a lovely day.